On Thursday the 8th of September, TV channels around the world shared the news that many of us had been dreading. A few moments ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Britain's longest reigning monarch was a dog lover who had a fascination with a quirky Welsh working dog. Today on the show, we learn about how the Queen's fascination with corgis began, and we travel from the cellars of Windsor Castle to Honeymoon in the Surrey Hills and to the set of The Crown, always with a corgi at our side. Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. On the show today, we discuss the Queen's longest relationship. Not the incredible 73-year marriage she shared with the Duke of Edinburgh. But the 89-year bond that she shared with Corgis. Like all relationships, it's had its ups and downs. There have been offspring and the occasional fights. And today, in tribute to Her Majesty, we will be looking back at Britain's royal dogs and sharing some fascinating insights into the monarch's love of this rare and hard-working breed. We will also discuss how the Queen's adoration for corgis helped change the future of that breed. That and more on today's show. So, if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's go for a walk, because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? Whether you're a royalist or a republican, if you're a dog lover, it's likely you have felt some connection to the 96-year-old Queen Elizabeth II, who passed away earlier this month. She reigned for 70 years on the throne with an assortment of corgis always at her side. She's one of those dog owners who just loved a particular breed, didn't she? And I know you're one of those as well. I am. Not a corgi. We have people on our team who are corgi lovers, but I'm a particular fan of a specific breed. A Maltese. So I understand the the connection that, you know, you can get for a certain breed, and that is the type of dog I want to have by my side forever and ever. And, you know, I kind of come from a different point of view, which is that I love all dogs, and I sort of want to try out all the different breeds in my lifetime. <laughs> I mean, I, I won't be able There's to do lot. that. There's a lot. Yeah, but I kind of think... You need to increase your dog family a lot. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Mm, yeah, I might have to run that by my husband. <laughs> so uh, anyway, back to the Queen. Over the last few weeks, there's been quite quite a lot of reflection here in the UK on quite how far and wide her image and royal branding has permeated our society. I mean, it's literally everywhere. It's on the currency, on stamps, it's on post boxes. There are royal warrants on businesses that bear her initials. And it's everywhere. And it will need to be updated over the coming years with that of her son, King Charles III. But the corgis have also left a lasting legacy. They appear in paintings, photographs, statues, all over pop culture, which I could talk about for ages. And they were also in an animated movie, which was released a couple of years ago. I'm the Queen's corgi. I'm so popular, Her Majesty is putting my picture on a mug. Smartphone. Key fobs, pens, caps, umbrella. Toilet brushes. Very impressive. Put simply, they are amongst the best-known dogs in the world. But do people know the name of the breed? Well, we went to dog parks around the world to find out if people knew. What was the Queen's favorite dog breed? Corgis. Corgis. Corgis and... Oh, sugar, I can't remember the rest of them, but corgis were her favorites. Welsh corgis, right? I have no idea. (laughs) Porgies. Corgis. 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 (laughs) The queen had lots of corgis and a dorgies. Everyone knows about the queen's corgis. Corgis. That's what they are. She had corgis. I'm aware she's a corgi fanatic. The queen of England had corgis. I actually don't know, but if I were to guess, it would be... Corgi. The Queen got her first corgi in 1933. That's so long ago that many people just assume that corgis have 
always been a part of the British royal family. But Kira Farrell from the Kennel Club, she's their historian. When you say the Kennel Club, that would be the British Kennel Club. It, is there? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, there is another one. There's the American Kennel Club. No, we are the Kennel Club, and the oh, American the, one is the American Kennel Club. I see. If you have to ask, no, okay, okay, but you're an American. Okay, the Kennel Club. What did the historian say? She said it's not always been the case. There's no tradition of the royal family having corgis before Her Majesty the Queen became interested in them. So people often ask me if there's a long association between the royal family and the corgi. There isn't really. It's the, it's within the lifetime of Her Majesty. Dookie, who was the first corgi the Queen had as a child, sparked a love for the breed, which lasted nearly three quarters of a century and spanned 30 individual dogs. To understand what created this incredible bond between the breed and the monarch, it's important to understand what was going on in her life when that first dog became her childhood pet. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. Author Caroline Perry has recently written a children's book called The Corgi and the Queen, And she says that moment changed not only the course of history, but also young Princess Elizabeth's life forever. Her life was very much turned upside down when her uncle abdicated. Her parents had wanted her to grow up out of the spotlight. They were trying to give her a very normal childhood. She was playing with regular children before her uncle abdicated. And suddenly all that changed and at the age of 10, you're told, well, actually, your normal life is over and you're next in line to this road. It was really overwhelming and not a life she chose. But She very much took solace and comfort in her animals. She was always happiest with her Shetland pony, Peggy, with her little corgis. So young Princess Elizabeth turned to Dookie for comfort and support as the monarchy was shaken up and Britain was headed towards another world war. But it wasn't until the Queen received the gift of Susan for her 18th birthday that the royal canine dynasty with 14 generations of pets begun. Caroline Perry says that she became enthralled with the story of the Queen's bond to the breed when she started researching the book. I just thought it was such an incredible story of how just that love and that that bond between a young princess and an animal, that it inspired such an enduring love affair with the corgi breed. She was separated from her parents during the war. She was very lonely and her and her sister had to sleep in the cellars of Windsor Castle because... Hitler actually wanted that as his prize. That was his number one target. You can imagine for these young princesses, it was all very terrifying. Jim, I actually Googled Windsor Castle cellars because this image of the princesses in the cellars, I wanted to know what they looked like. And, you know, I sort of imagined kind of dusty, you know, sort of spiders and dark and everything else. Well, there's actually a cafe in the cellar of Windsor Castle now, and it looks pretty nice. But I wouldn't have wanted to sleep down there as a child because it's not very homely. It's quite cavernous. So, of course, the war lasted for six years, pretty much the whole of the Queen's teenage years. And she became an adult during wartime. Here's Caroline Perry again. And so her 18th birthday came around during the war. And the only thing she asked for, as you can imagine, she could probably have chosen anything her heart desired. She asked for a a corgi of her own. Reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we should pause here to acknowledge that there might be a few children or young adults or mature adults who might be thinking that it's a good idea to get a corgi because they're going to be in the spotlight again with the Queen's death and the publication of Caroline Perry's book. But corgi ownership is not something to be jumped into lightly. They're a type of herding dog for moving cattle around, not sheep, but cattle. And they have to be very brave, very tough little dogs, because as the name suggests, they get in around the heels of the cattle and they snap and keep the cattle moving that way. They've got tremendous drive because they are bred to be out in old weathers doing this quite tough job, which means if they're kept in the house where it's nice and warm, they can tend to be a little bit lazy and get a little bit Round around the middle. We all know people like that, don't we? (laughs) Fortunately... This is audio. (laughs) Fortunately, the Royal Corgis had a team to look after and exercise them. A personal chef to cook only the healthiest meals for them. And most importantly, an owner 
who loved the outdoor life as much as them. Her Majesty the Queen always did the right thing with them. She had them out all the time, worked them hard, kept them running, kept them out and about, enjoying the open air and behaving as corgis should. But they are very spirited, very characterful, intelligent, like all herding dogs, because they have to remember commands, and I would say brave. So back to the young Princess Elizabeth, that dog that she had, Susan, that's what she called it, that she had received for her 18th birthday became a hugely loved dog. Loved so much, in fact, that when it came to marrying the Duke of Edinburgh, well, he had to accept that there would always be three of them in this marriage. At least until Queen Elizabeth got another corgi. She just developed this incredibly strong bond with this little dog. She took her everywhere with her and so much so that even on her wedding day, she couldn't bear to be parted from her. So when she and Philip were riding through the streets of London, hundreds of thousands of well-wishers were hoping to catch a glimpse of the radiant royal bride. Nobody realized that hidden beneath a handwoven rug on the carriage floor, little Susan was there. Even on her wedding day, she had to be with her best friend. I totally get that. My dog was at my wedding. In fact, we have an episode coming up in a few weeks about dogs who participate in weddings. So I get it. Absolutely. Well, it wasn't just the wedding parade that Susan accompanied the couple on. And this is perhaps one you can relate to as well. She went on their honeymoon. As did my dog, Maui. <laughs> well, anyway, Vicki Edwards is the author of several books, including Dogs, a Miscellany, and the Duke of Edinburgh, the portrait of a great British institution. Susan went on honeymoon with them. Some people say that it was all done very under the radar, but there's nothing to really suggest that. When I was researching the book, I read something that said, oh, she was concealed underneath travel rugs and she'd got a hot water bottle. Which sort of, I think, people wanted then to turn into, oh, she was taken and she wasn't meant to. It was all very secret squirrel. But actually, I don't think it was. I think she was just like any good dog owner. I think the Queen was just keeping her pooch comfy. Why not? My dog goes under travel rugs, although I draw the line at the hot water bottle. Of course. Susan was at the Queen's side until 1959. And it's well documented that the monarch found her death extremely hard. She even chose the inscription for Susan's headstone when she died, and she said she dreaded that day coming. She never forgot Susan. Descendants of Susan lived on in the royal household for another 59 years until Willow, the 14th generation of royal pups, died in 2018. Throughout her reign, what Lady Diana called the Queen's, quote, moving carpet, have given a mixed reception to different members of the royal family. When Meghan and Harry did their first interview as an engaged couple, people were as interested to know how the corgis received her as how the Queen did. And the, and the corgis took to you straight away. <laughs> That's true. For the last 33 years being barked at, this one walks in absolutely nothing. Just laying on just my feet during tea, it was very sweet. Was like, oh. <laughs> Perhaps the corgis just naturally bonded with the female members of the royal household more Certainly, the Duke of Edinburgh never loved them as much as his wife, according to Vicky Edwards. I don't think he had the same kind of affection for them that the Queen did. I mean, he is reported to have said at one or two occasions, oh, bloody dogs, why do you have so many of them? But I think they saw dogs very differently. I think Philip saw them very much as sporting equipment almost, whereas I think the, the Queen genuinely had a real affection the Queen owned more than 30 corgis, several doggies, which are dash and corgi mixes. We're going to get into that debate again, aren't we, about how to pronounce? Yeah, uh, you mean dachshund. dachshund. For, the, for, the, for those who don't understand her, dachshund. Dachshund. <laughs> oh, dachshund. dear. And at the time of her death, she also owned a cocker spaniel. But it's obvious that the corgis were her favourites. Don't mm -hmm. let the doggies hear that. And um, we wondered if there was anything about that breed in particular that suited them to royal life. Well, here's Vicky again. What we know about, for instance, a Welsh corgi, we know that they're very strong and athletic. They're affectionate without being needy. They're quite independent dogs, which I guess if your mistress or master is going off on a royal tour and he's going to leave you for a while, that's probably quite critical. But they are absolutely portable. I guess they would be quite practical in the sense of you just pick them up, tuck them under your arm and off you trot. Corgi companionship saw Princess Elizabeth and later the Queen through the abdication of Edward VIII, a world war and the illness and later death of her husband. 
a few years ago when her husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, was ill. Prince Andrew gifted her two dogs, one of which sadly passed away. Vicky Edwards thinks her canine companions must have been a great comfort to her. I think when he was poorly, Prince Andrew and I believe his daughters, also princesses Beatrice and Eugenie, bought the dog as a way of keeping her company, perhaps in the way that the Duke used to, but also very much as a distraction apart from anything else. It must have been a very worrying time for her. But I guess that being around both of those dogs were links in some way to Philip. And I guess there's comfort in that, reassurance. One thing many of us will relate to is how the Queen's dogs probably helped her deal with the loneliness and uncertainty of the last couple of years. Good evening. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades, and this country is not alone. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. Here's Vicky Edwards again. We know this. During the pandemic, she was reported as saying that kind of got her through. She took the dogs for very long walks, as many of us did. And I think also they were very much part of her daily routine, feeding the dogs, walking the dogs. One of her aides, I believe, once said that was the way she cleared her head. And I think all dog owners will relate to that. Walking a dog is a really wonderful way to get that headspace in silent but reassuring company. Life with the palace corgis hasn't always been totally smooth. Corgi's natural instinct is to herd. And in 1989, it was reported by the British press that the palace had to hire an animal psychologist to deal with some of the pet's less desirable behaviors. Over the years, they've had a few run-ins with palace staff, and yes, even the proverbial postman. A mailman or two had a corgi nipping at their ankles. Kira Farrell from the Kennel Club again. It's something that we wouldn't encourage corgis to do. If they are going to be doing that, they need to be herding cattle, not postmen. Mm. Looking at corgis on rescue sites, it's unfortunately all too common to see mention of bite history, which is often the reason that they are surrendered. Wow. It is part of their natural instinct. It is how they would move an animal around. Every dog can have a slip up from time to time, but careful breeding and handling should ensure that they are not nipping humans. But it is part of how corgis work when they're doing their traditional work. We are going to take a break, but next up we will hear how the Queen's reign and some of her more memorable cultural moments have affected the popularity of her favorite dog breed over her 89-year association with them. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Oh, every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. Oh, I want to run. I want to sniff. Ooh, I want to find a good stick to carry. Oh, I want to roll in the grass. Oh, and warm my belly in the sun. Oh, I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want ever pop. The green, glassy beef liver smell wakes my senses. Oh, you may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy. <laughs> it infuses any food you give me with healthy life vibrancy. Oh, <laughs> I can feel it. Ever pop traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. I'm so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pop you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup every day. Welcome back. 
Before the break, we find out how the Queen's uncle's abdication and the Second World War cemented a bond between the Queen and her corgis, a bond which was so strong her favourite dog Susan even accompanied the monarch on her wedding day parade and honeymoon. And we wanted to know whether the corgis' association with the Queen had helped or hindered this breed's popularity. We were surprised by what Kira Farrell from The Kennel Club told us. When Her Majesty the Queen and Princess Margaret got their first corgi when they were little girls, they were not that well known. They were well known on the Welsh farms where they worked, but as a dog that people had as a pet, they were not that well known at that point. A very popular book was printed in 1936 showing the princesses and their dogs at home. And the breed began to become more popular after that. Now, that book that Kira is referring to is called Our Princesses and Their Dogs. And it was a hardback book of photos. It was kind of like a 1930s version of Hello Magazine. That's how I can describe it. (laughs) And it had these very staged photos of these two lovely little girls in very elaborate dresses in locations around the palace and the gardens with their dogs. And I'm sure would have taken a lot of time to photograph. It was published just before Christmas 1936. And it went on sale just days before Edward VIII abdicated. So you could say that this was kind of the first bit of PR for the girl (laughs) who was one day going to become queen. And Corgi's got another bump in popularity a couple of decades later when the queen was actually on the throne. When they really took off was the 1950s and 60s. Their popularity peaked in 1961 with about 8,000 registrations per year. 8,000 doesn't sound like a crazy number, but how does that compare to something like Labradors, which I think are the most popular breed in the UK. You are correct. Labrador Retrievers are the most popular pure breed in the UK. Mm. Although, of course, there are many more mixed breed puppies born every year. The Kennel Club says there are nearly 40,000 Labradors registered in the UK each year. So even at their peak, Corgis didn't come anywhere near to that. What happened after the 1960s? Well, dog ownership in the UK actually doubled between 1965 and 2016 from 4.7 million dogs in the UK to 9 million. But corgi ownership didn't follow the same path. Then it was a slow decline until the last 10 years or so when they did get into such low numbers that they were what we would call a vulnerable native breed, a breed that registers very few puppies per year, under 300. Now, that list of endangered native British dog breeds, which they keep up to date all the time, is quite interesting Mm -hmm. because it also includes a breed that might get a little post-2022 bump in popularity. Have you got any guesses what it might be? Post-2022 popularity in... Oh, 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 the um, the King King Charles uh, Cavalier. Ah, yes, the King Charles Spaniel, yes. So that's on the list at the moment of British endangered native species. And I'm just wondering if maybe the association with Charles, maybe that'll get a little <laughs> uplift, you don't know. None of the royals actually own one, but the name is very of the moment. That was my connection. So only 91 puppies are registered last year. So we will actively keep an eye on that list and see if it increases in popularity under the reign of the new monarch. Now, here is a question that I have heard, and as a Brit, you should definitely know this. Are King Charles Spaniels allowed into Parliament? I I, I heard that a long time ago. Whoever named them King Charles Spaniels could... Yeah. No, I heard they had this like this special decree that they could like go wherever they wanted, including into Parliament. I have never heard this before. <laughs> this is just this is you crazy Americans. This is something you've made up. So what what's the logic behind this? Why King Charles Spaniels? Because he King Charles the Second or whoever came up with the breed's name said that they're special dogs and they can go anywhere. Anyway, you you don't know what I'm talking about. No, I I think we will have to investigate this and see if there's any merit to this. And maybe we'll try to get one of them into Parliament. But you don't know about that. I don't know about this, but I am thinking this could be great for Dog Miss Debunked for the next episode. Ooh. Or perhaps validated. (laughs) 
We don't know. I don't believe you, Jim. I think it's it sounds. Well, everyone would have a King Charles Spaniel if they could go anywhere. That's they wouldn't any, be in danger. Well, you can bring dogs. Every, I've been in many pubs in England where there's mm. a little dog or a big dog next. To, yeah. I mean, you think I would know about it in the UK rather than you knowing about it in America? It just sounds like you've you've kind of heard <laughs> this true. old rumor and you've been cut off and you haven't heard the truth. <laughs> we'll see. We'll have to go to the internet and find out, listener. If, if you know the answer to this, let us know. Now, back to the corgis, which I do know about. (laughs) You'll be pleased to hear it is not all doom and gloom when it comes to their popularity. Popular culture helped lift them off that endangered list a few years ago. They have had a slow, steady and what we would call a healthy revival in the last couple of years. Not a mass revival where people have gone out to to grab any corgi they can. But their numbers are back up and it's partially to do with the crown. But we also had the great fun stunt at the 2012 Olympics when people got to see the corgis in uh, doing a bit of an espionage action with James Bond. And we also had a corgi recently in Bridgerton. A little bit of an ahistorical corgi, I will say, because it certainly would not have been a Regency pet. But as a bit of fun, yes, they had a corgi in Bridgerton. With the Queen's passing on September 8th, there were questions hanging in the air about the future of the corgis. Some of those questions we now have answers to. The Queen's remaining four pets will spend the rest of their days under the care of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson. But on a wider scale, will the Queen's death mean these pups will risk becoming an endangered breed once again? Will they be forgotten? Carolyn Perry hopes not. Her book, which is published later this year, is already creating a new generation of corgi lovers. I sent this book to my agent at the beginning of the pandemic, this was, when everything was shutting down here in in the States. She has a young daughter. You can imagine, again, similarities to the war in the sense that the isolation of the children, they were suddenly away from their friends at school. They weren't allowed to see their extended family. Nobody knew what was happening, how long this was going to last. We were all terrified when we didn't know what was happening. And she read this story to her young daughter and her daughter was so captivated with this tale that she, she started having an imaginary dog named Susan and she really begged and pleaded with her parents to get her a little corgi named Susan. She ended up with a little corgi puppy who is named Susan. So there is a real Susan. And this real Susan really helped this young girl get through those very dark days during the pandemic and 100% on the back of the Queen's story. I think that is remarkable. That is very cool. I bet this book is going to inspire a few children to ask for a corgi for Christmas. Maybe they won't all be named Susan, but who knows? Now, we've touched on why corgis may not be suitable for every home. But what about the reasons that you would want to pick a corgi? Well, I wanted to know that too. So I asked Kira and Caroline to sum up why they love this particular breed. They get so much attention when you see them out. I speak to my friends who are lucky enough to have corgis, and they say, it's like taking a celebrity out with you. Everyone wants to pet them. I don't think you can ever own a corgi. They very much own you. They are very appealing to look at. They're cute in the face. They've got those lovely big ears and they are, they're just funny little characters. They are very, they're smallish dogs, but they've got a great big personality, which is in keeping with their work. So I think that contrast between quite a small dog and quite a feisty character is something that makes them very appealing. And as we reflect on the loss of the woman who was undoubtedly Britain's highest profile dog lover, let's hear again from Vicky Edwards. So there's a wonderful quote by the writer Jean Hill that I found when I was researching a book about dog ownership, and it feels really perfect for right now. As someone who met so many people and shook so many hands, I think the Queen would endorse these words absolutely. And the quote goes, nobody can fully understand the meaning of love unless he's owned a dog. A dog can show you more honest affection with a flick of his tail than a man can gather through a lifetime of handshakes. Claire, thanks so much for bringing us this tale from England. I know that people all over the world are so connected to this. And if you want to do something to mark the passing of the Queen, and you can't get to Buckingham Palace to lay flowers, we have put together a short list of rescue shelters that help corgis, including the wonderfully named Queen's Best Stumpy Dog Rescue in California. You can find that information in the show notes for today's episode. 
And we've also included a link to Caroline Perry's beautiful illustrated children's book, The Corgi and the Queen, which is out hopefully later this year. They were going to publish it in January, but I think they'll bring it out before Christmas. I want to thank you for taking us along on your walk today. Please don't forget, if you enjoyed the show, please follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app or on YouTube. And if you're in the dog park or talking to fellow dog lovers, make sure you tell a friend about our show and also check out our sister shows, including The Long Leash with James Jacobson. All of that is on our website, dogpodcastnetwork.com. I'm Claire Mansell. And I'm James Jacobson. Thank you so much for listening today. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Vicki Edwards is the author of several books, including Dogs, a Missing... Miscellany? Miscellany? How do you Miscellany. We don't know that word in America. <laughs> Surely we don't. Ayla's like, I, we don't know. I don't know. Okay. Miscellany. You speak British today. It's a very quirky thing. Yeah.